And uh, we've been having so much luck in the studio today. I just have a feeling about this show that it's going to strafe you. It's going to fuck your head up. Every second, every breath, every moment of this show is going to change your life. It's going to make you a billionaire. It's going to start the revolution. It's going to do things to you you've never imagined before. Or maybe not. Mondo 2000 is here to cover the leading edge in hyperculture. We'll bring you the latest in human technological interactive mutation forms as they happen. We're talking cyber shatorpa, bringing cyber culture to the people. Artificial awareness modules, visual music, vid scan magazines, William Gibson's cyberspace matrix fully realised. Our scouts are out there, on the frontier, sniffing the breeze, and guess what? All the old war horses are dead. Eco-fundamentalism is out. Conspiracy theory is demode. Drugs are obsolete. There's a new whiff of apocalypticism across the land. A general sense that we are living at a very special juncture in the evolution of the species. Back in the 60s, Carly Simon's brother wrote a book called What to Do Until the Apocalypse Comes. It was about going back to the land, growing tubers and soybeans, reading oil lamps, finite possibilities, and small is beautiful. It was boring, yet the pagan innocence and idealism that was the sixties remains. It continues to exert its fascination to those kids. Look at old footage of Woodstock and you wonder, where have all those wide-eyed, ecstatic, orgasm-slurping kids gone? They're all across the land, dormant like deeply buried perennials. But their mutated nucleotides have given us a whole new generation of sharpies, mutants and superbrights. And in them, we must put our faith in power. The cybernet is in place. If fusion is real, we'll find out about it fast. The old information elites are crumbling. The kids are at the controls. Hey, what's up everyone? This is Satori D and I have a special guest and interview today. Are you serious of Bondo 2000? Hey, how's it going, are you? Doing okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, so I, I guess that's uh, what I kind of wanted to start off with, like let's kind of go back to this, uh, I guess kind of towards your beginning of how you started off starting your, your magazine with High Frontiers that evolved into Mondo 2000. If you kind of want to talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, well, High Frontiers, uh, it actually uh, started with a uh, 500 microgram liquid LSD trip uh, the day after John Lennon was, was shot. And I had been reading my uh, Timothy Weary and Robert Anton Wilson, and I had a kind of uh, I'm not sure how to describe it, an ecstatic trip. Felt that uh, things were good underneath it all. Something, something underlying everything that was marvelous. And uh, at the time felt that the future was going to be uh, marvelous and playful and uh, be boosted by uh, science and technology as per the uh, Leary Wilson influence and so forth. And, you know, I had a kind of, I was in a uh, sort of punk band at the time. I was in college. Um, I, I decided to marry kind of all these influences together. You know, having uh, come out of the uh, 60s counterculture, but also having come out of, out of various 70s uh, countercultures as well. Wanting to uh, put something together that uh, reflected uh, something very contemporary but at the same time something that uh, dipped back into uh, the ecstatic momentum that existed uh, for about uh, 66 and 67 and try to marry those things a little bit t together. Um, so eventually I, I made my way from upstate New York, small college town in upstate New York, to uh, Berkeley and it took me a couple of years to uh, get the feel of Berkeley, California, becoming a Californian, uh, 
uh, a little bit like entering a foreign country from uh, New York. Uh, I mean, even upstate New York, people had have a or, or had a dark uh, sense of humor, and if you'd say something really uh, sarcastic and, and dark to somebody, then uh, in California. They tend to take you literally, and be very sincere about it or, or whatever. So um, anyway, there was some, uh, there was a period of adaptation, and then by uh, the end of 1983, as it came 1984, I was uh, getting the first issue of High Frontiers ready, and that was called uh, the Space Age Newspaper of Psychedelics. Uh, science, human potential, irreverence, and modern art. I'm very embarrassed I didn't call it postmodern art, but uh, somehow, somehow, uh, the uh, the language. Uh, although I was super into uh, reading those kinds of uh, publications like semiotext and uh, various uh, intellectual discourses uh, that uh, would have been defined as postmodernism. Somehow the uh, language of that had slipped through my uh, the cracks in my brain. Anyway, so that's uh, that's kind of where it started. And uh, so is, I find it kind of interesting. So as you were developing the magazine, I guess you were also responding to what was going on with that, all around you. And you also kept on um, evolving the name of the magazine, right? Yeah, we, we we changed the name to Escape Detection. It was uh, Jack Bulwark, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, we did pretty well at Escaping Detection. We High Frontiers was was kind of hot in its own way. It got close to about a twenty thousand circulation, which in terms of zines was pretty awesome. And then we changed the name to Reality Hackers, and went kind of downhill in terms of uh, people finding us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But then Mondo uh, had had sort of an immediate resonance, so uh, uh, you know, just just in terms of uh, influence and so forth, um, everything picked up once we uh, landed on the name Mondo 2000. And all credit goes to Allison Kennedy, aka Queen Lou, for uh, saying Mondo to me when I came to her room and said, uh, "Everybody's using 2000." To sell crap, we should put 2,000 in our name, and she said, "Mondo." <laughs> and she uh, pictured how great the lettering was. The lettering was really good for potential design. But she was absolutely correct. It's a great uh, term for uh, for uh, design potential, and we wound up getting a great design done uh, initially by a guy named Broombar, R.I.P. The great Broombar, uh, visual artist uh, in Germany, who uh, we were introduced to by Timothy Leary, and uh, variously uh, mutated uh, largely, I think, by Bart Nagel. Yeah, I really do like uh, the the aesthetics of the whole magazine, and uh, even you know, I've been going through, as you know, I've been <laughs> playing around with a lot of that imagery. And it's really, um, I don't know, it just stands out to me. It definitely got a, a lot of uh, praise for uh, the design of the magazine. The first issue, which was black and white, was really designed by Queen Lou uh, with help from uh, somebody named Taylor Barcroft. And uh, even that one looks good. Yeah. I was also thinking about just a couple of, like, um, any stories of the, those early days that kind of like still stand out in your mind as something funny something you know that was just going on in the whole scene i guess well i, I think uh, towards the end of 84 85 uh lord knows a character we will just stay with that name for now uh became our art director i was editing the magazine with uh, somebody who uh called himself somerset mau mau and uh, the first magazine was really largely uh, dedicated to uh, psychedelics, psychedelic drugs, psychedelic awareness, uh, ideas that uh, rotated around the notions of psychedelia 
um, including the science and technology that we would eventually uh, focus on and so forth. So anyway, we uh, we started uh, doing a fair amount of what we were writing about. Um, and th there was one trip that uh, we took, I think it was LSD, and uh, we were up uh, on a uh, walking path in Marin County. <clears throat> and as we were coming down, we all expressed the same sense that uh, we were coming down into a parallel reality, that uh, everything was the same but a little bit different, and uh, uh, we had jumped from one reality into a <clears throat> into a different parallel reality. Um, so we went back uh, into uh, Mill Valley, California, where uh, Somerset Mau Mau uh, had a place at that time. Uh, we left up, uh, Lord knows, and it got to be around 11 a.m. when we were hungry. We went to this burrito place in Mill Valley, and the guy in front of us was naked. So at that point, we were we were really pretty certain that we had to come down in an alternative universe. <laughs> and the guy behind the counter kind of shrugged and said, "Oh yeah, he does that all the time." Now I, I'd never seen him before or, or since, uh, but uh, we said, so we called uh, Terrence McKenna to ask him if the universe had changed, <laughs> and uh, he just howled with laughter. And then we uh, went off to uh, some beach and drank some beers. It's a horrible little beach that you can see uh, San Quentin from. Is that the one that's in the room? Yeah, San, San Quentin. Uh, really desultory, uh, awful thing. But we, we were planning this. Uh, we had made contact with somebody who was managing Robert Anton Wilson. And we were planning, he was available to speak for five hundred dollars, uh, and we thought that was great. And we were planning an event, or we were, we were going to plan an event uh, with Robert Anton Wilson speaking as a benefit for the uh, magazine, so that uh, we could get our second edition published. And uh, we had decided that we thought it would be a good idea to do it on a houseboat that uh, had been famous because Alan Watts had uh, lived there and held seminars there and events and so forth. So, so we went to that houseboat. We drove over to the houseboat after uh, still trailing on the LSD but having drank uh, three beers each also. So kind of sodden, sodden trails. And uh, we tapped on the door and this kind of this really old woman answered the door who sort of had the presentation of an old crone. You know, you know, I mean, just to us tripping. She looked like an old crone, and she, in this really scratchy voice, she complained for about an hour while we stood there at the door. And uh, there's some story about how uh, she was trying to maintain the spirit of uh, the Alan Watts houseboat, and some uh, yuppies were trying to uh, ruin it for her. And uh, it turned out that uh, she was just there she was she had snuck in she was just squatting so I, I suppose there's no real conclusion to that story other than that uh, we took some drugs and funny things happened and we actually <laughs> landed in an alternative universe i'm not really sure yeah i mean you probably um sent a ripple through the course of uh reality and uh, changed everything so we have you to for for this <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess one of the funniest things uh, when when I was listening to you on uh, Team Human and you were talking about Operation Mindfuck was too successful and that uh, you uh, Douglas Rushoff kind of laughs is like so are you taking responsibility for what's happening and he said yeah I kind of am <laughs> yeah we did it <laughs> you guys did it uh, but I think that's uh, some of the the legacy of, of what you guys were doing at that time with Mondo. And as I uh, kind of researched more about you guys and and just kind of in the context of what's happening right now is like you, the internet um, has this kind of, I don't know, did you guys, did you guys were able to see how 
strange, I guess? The internet was gonna mutate or be able to have this meme magic that we have now and like um, I, I don't think very many people were talking or thinking about the internet as the place in which the entire economy lives a, a place for commerce and for everything that uh, comes with commerce um, I think we're almost universally thinking about it as a place for information and communication and not as the place where our money was going to be and uh, everything related to that. So, I mean, we were expecting things to be maybe even stranger, but in a different way. Um, I think, I mean, when you're looking at a future that isn't there, it's much richer in some ways in the imagination than it is in reality. And I think when we started Mongo 2000 in 1989, as uh, being among some of the few people who were aware of the extent to which technology drives human civilization and was about to drive human civilization, it was possible to think that all kinds of crazy stuff was going to happen by the millennium. I think that's that was the name, the Mon Mondo 2000. Um, even uh, I understand at the beginning of the Clinton administration, uh, I think it was John Perry Barlow, but it might have been somebody else talked to Al Gore. And Al Gore was worried that the singularity might happen during his administration. That administration would have been from 2000 to 2008. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, it was possible to imagine that all kinds of extremely radical things were going to happen technologically in the 90s that uh, haven't occurred and uh, may never occur or at least are taking a much longer time to occur. And I mean, the big one, the one that was really popular was the intervention of virtual reality. And of course, we have massive virtuality now. We, we live in we live in virtuality, and, and that, that's a big problem. That's a big part of our political problem, is that people are still biological, uh, but uh, they tend to believe uh, or act as if the stuff that uh, they want to believe in their heads is more important than the stuff that's uh, actually occurring in materiality. And again, uh, we go back to uh, us blowing up consensus reality uh, being problematic, uh, but um, yeah, at the time, it seemed like who knows? Maybe uh, there would be molecular technology by the end of the century. I had no real reason to believe that, but at the start of it all, at the start of the '90s, it, there was this feeling that anything was possible. And then towards the end of the '90s, there was the long boom, and it was when when uh, big capitalism first moved onto the internet. And that was a period of, of kind of huge optimism um, that the entire world seemed to be becoming hip. And I mean, we, all, although we were critical, I was critical of, of the long boom and, and the sort of neoliberalism of that period of uh, Bill Clinton and uh, Tony Blair and so forth. Underneath it all, there was a feeling that, oh yeah, maybe this is all going to work. Uh, you know, the Berlin had, wall had come down there was one superpower and uh, you know, it was kind of dissipating into a, a global situation and um, maybe maybe all this will uh, work somehow and the 21st century was just kind of a jolt wasn't it and, uh, first with uh, the election of uh, George W. Bush the uh, Donald Trump of his day and uh, of course, 9/11, uh, and, and onward, onward from there. Of course, the end of the 90s, there was a bit of a, a jolt. There was uh, the, uh, the, that the long boom uh, turned out to be a, a small bang. So, yeah, that kind of petered out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my joke that I like to always say is that during Bush, I thought it could never get worse than this, and then already a, a year into Trump. Like I, it like only took uh, eight years to get like Trump, and in one year, he's it, to me it feels worse 
than than Bush. It's like I can't even fathom what's gonna happen in like four years. Like, <laughs> like I think a pro yeah. wrestler. I think a pro wrestler <laughs> is a thing, probably. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, he he does have pro wrestling ties. Yeah, yeah he has. He's a bit of a pro wrestler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. He he definitely has a. Uh, that that kind of flair and for dramatic <laughs> and, to make George W. Bush seem uh, sensitive and intelligent that that's an incredible accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, that that is always the most mind-boggling. Where you have where you it was like me. I, I mean, I thought like I, I remember after 9/11 and and we're going into the Iraq War and I, I was in in college and I'm like having a party at my house and we're all uh, you know smoking weed and we're all kind of wasted and he was like you know what nothing matters like the world's gonna end and by the time george bush is terms over like i can't see any way out of this and then now i'm like longing for the good old days of george bush <laughs> i don't know yeah. if it's because i'm getting older or something <laughs> well when i was growing up i mean the, the apocalypse was nuclear and, and that was the sword uh, of Damocles that hung over everybody's head. And, uh, you know, I mean, that keeps on coming back for, for uh, return performance. Um, but now you have the weather. Um, and that's like pretty much like being sentenced by a judge. You know, that, there's not going to be any pardon uh, from the results of climate change. I mean, I, th I think there's ways to prepare for it, and there's ways to slow it down, but uh, uh, there's a kind of inevitability. And, you know, in terms of the, I the idealistic aspects or, or the, uh, the optimistic aspects of what we we're projecting in Mondo 2000, post-scarcity might be, might be canceled by climate change. Yeah, I think post-scarcity was really the sort of underlying utopian wish of the uh, late 20th century counterculture. I mean, I, I do think work is is over in its way. Some some types of work are are, are being replaced by technology, but uh, you know, we'll all be uh, taking care of uh, people who've lost their homes and building building wall, sea walls and things like that. There'll be, there'll be labor to do to uh, overcome the, uh, the change in the weather. I think that's something that's been kind of this weird juxtaposition between this kind of theater slash carnival of uh, the politics on uh, the backdrop of like what's actually happening in our environment. Like just here in, in California, um, First, it happened up north where you were with, with the wildfires, and then down here south, I mean, all the valley just started to burn up. And yeah, and don't forget uh, Florida, uh, where where my uh, where my mom lives. Yeah, incredible flooding. I mean, there have been floods and fires before, but not uh, that many, and it squeezed into that short of a time. Yeah, yeah. There's something, you know, weird, I guess, it, I don't know, it's just um, weird acceleration of everything happening. Yeah. <laughs> it just that, like, you know, this, this spiral, the spiral fractal of history is, you know, condensing more, like more and more uh, of progress, digress, and everything just like happening. Like within this whole year, it's it just seems like there's... I don't know if it's because we're more plugged in as far as we're getting bombarded with information, but it does seem like more stuff is happening. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's sort of the intentional politics of distraction. Yeah. Uh, that we continue to be horrified day after day by, by uh, various things in the, in the news cycle. Um, that uh, kind of keeps our eyes off the uh, bigger picture. Uh, so I mean, there, there there's that. Uh, but yes, there there are events as well. I mean, one thing one thing you don't really have that you had uh, with George Bush, although uh, 
I suppose that happened in his second or third year if you don't have a major uh, military action by the United States yet. And that's something that uh, <laughs> I joke around too. I was like, man, all this stuff that we're, we're concerned about with Trump or whatever, but actually nothing has really seriously happened. You know, like like with George Bush, he had the 9-11 event, which yeah. made, that was its catalyst for a lot of our engagement in the Middle East and, and all sorts of stuff with the, the Patriot Act and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And there's not that single event that has happened, but there's already stuff that's happening that probably will have these um, adverse effects that I see. You know, just recently, the other day, um, net neutrality gets repealed. And that's something that I think, you know, what whatever it is, but the forces that be, it seems like a lot of stuff, you know, when the, first, when the internet first broke, you know, there's talk about disrupting the whole uh, system and like, you know, we're getting like connected peer to peer and people started doing commerce on there. Like anybody could set up shop and do all this kind of stuff. And then slowly but surely um, they're trying to get a grasp of, of what's going on. And, and you see them trying to uh, toll the, the bandwidth. <laughs> it's like, okay, we can't necessarily put the genie back in the bottle but we could build up dams and we could control the the infrastructure but then i also see hope even though there's pro problems with like let's say blockchain as far as they they need to uh something like a lightning network where they improve uh the energy consumption and the scaling up there's a problem with the scaling up but there's at least you know that framework for i think last year they uh, at the internet archive they had um breaking open the internet, kind of building a new uh, infrastructure to keep the internet open and that it's designed in a way that no one, that you don't decentralize it. So there's no like central point mesh networks or, or uh, so I think, you know, some line that I heard recently is like, life always finds a way and that we seem like as a species or life needs these ex pressures to kind of evolve or or mutate. And I guess kind of going back to something you used to say, you know, when you had that uh, that vision or acid trip and then you came over to the West Coast to help mutate uh, humanity. Uh, and I guess now in, in our present moment, I, I think, you know, there's signs around the edges where people are working towards that, uh, people are playing with that still. No matter what happens and even sometimes in spite and because of what's happening, that we as humanity and on the edges get kind of fired to to say, okay, this is how we're gonna circumvent that. This is what we're gonna do. Yeah. I guess it's the- Interesting to me, I, I think that the, the first uh, layer of the end of net neutrality uh, might be uh, commercial entertainment culture that uh, lays on top of the continuation of everything everybody else has been doing without interfering with it. And, and then it becomes a question of cultural choice in a way because, you know, uh, uh, we've allowed ourselves to a great extent to uh, be caged in to uh, what Jerry Lanier calls siren servers, these uh, corporate monoliths like uh, Facebook and like uh, Google, which we're, which we're on right now and so forth, that uh, have provided a great deal of convenience, uh, but have, have in their way put up fences in the internet so that uh, a billion people are corralled on Facebook, but they're not out in the open wilds of the net. And some of that is inevitable because, I mean, culturally, we weren't all going to be uh, sort of individual creators of our own spaces via which we would uh, interact with other people in other spaces and, and so forth. But most of us were going to find a place where we could communicate. You know, social media, I mean, I, I started off on the well, all our electronic link, and, you know, it was, that was a social network, and it was an okay thing. Um, so some of some of what happens now 
is going to be depend on to what extent people allow themselves to be ex uh, distracted by the uh, entertainment culture that further layers itself on top of the open internet. I mean, I'm already, you know, fairly distracted by Netflix and, and stuff like that. It's going to get better in, you know, in terms of, uh, of entertainment access. How distracted will I be by all that uh, good entertainment? Uh, and then how distracted will other, be, other people be? And I think that, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, really sort of closing down the free internet and turning and putting up turnstiles and uh, uh, further uh, censoring uh, open communication and so forth. Um, it's kind of a trickle down, you know, it happens slowly and it's sneaky. You know, it's not like it all gets shut down at once. But uh, anyway, that's that's my my wrap on it. And I do agree that there are uh, all kinds of uh, brilliant people from uh, hacker culture. Uh, and we're talking about the people who still want to take take over the world, and they're still they're still out there, and they're still brilliant, and they're, you know they're still up to stuff too. So uh, uh, there's always that uh, that dynamic. Yeah. We'll see what happens. And that kind of kind of circles back around to the concept of um, what evolved out of um, this phrase, uh, um, cyberpunk. You know, being a punk, and when I was younger. You know, I was, I remember when I first listened to some punk music and I was reading the lyrics of the Ramones and I thought, I could write a song like that. Like, <laughs> I could play power chords like that. Like, I thought, you know, stuff on the radio were the gods, right? And this is, I'm a mere mortal yeah. and I can't do that. And like, you know, Hollywood's these, these other people and I'm just this average person and what can I do? And then I see different things and I'm like, I could do that. I could write that. I could do that. But this attitude of uh, being a punk is like, you know, like, fuck them. I could do my own thing. Uh, I can make my own website. I could rip um, any TV show, actually, and play with their, their, their visuals and remix it and make my own thing and yeah. keep on going. I think, you know, I get distracted, too, as, as well. But I think, you know, part of what I do, what I, what I find cool as well is, is not only all there's all this media to consume but there's all this media to play with yeah. there's all like there's so many digital colors to to paint pictures with to to rip up and uh, recombine and that's what uh kind of uh fuels me as as i keep on going and whatever it is that i'm doing i don't even know what i'm doing but you know just having fun and and playing and and meeting interesting people and seeing who who's down to play <laughs> is always something cool you know and I, I think that's never gonna like that part of that that human spirit that that's something that's always gonna stick with us that is always gonna be here um but i guess moving forward it's something interesting that i wanted to bring up and we could start wrapping things up but for you what what have you seen on the new edge of like technology, art that gets you excited, a culture, uh, you know, whether it be music, new developments, um, people, writers, thinkers, or anything that, that uh, really that you're into right now. Uh, nothing really comes to mind. <laughs> nothing really comes to mind. Um, I mean, it, I mentioned earlier that uh, the hacking class is, is still at it. Yeah. That always fills me with interest. Um, Barrett Brown has a project, the name of which escapes me at the moment, but uh, it's, it's fundamentally uh, appears to be a situation for information hacking and uh, uh, investigative journalism, uh, a place where, where I people can safely uh, share, process, and then release uh, information that otherwise uh, 
doesn't get to the public. And uh, I think there's a uh, something missing now that oh, WikiLeaks has proved to be a, a degenerate institution. And I think this thing that Barrett Brown is is doing uh, might be might be the next thing. So I encourage people to look up Barrett Brown and and, and see what he's doing. Um, other than that, I mean, I, I hear music that just astonishes me now. Uh, most of most of it being made by uh, African American artists, uh, but you know, I don't, I never remember what it is. I just, I just hear it and uh, it disappears before I, I uh, know what's going on. But I mean, there there's this peculiar thing. I heard three or four different artists this peculiar thing it sounds like a mix of really commercial soul and hip-hop but then like there are interventions in it of like people just talking and like strange sort of avant-garde jazz like noise stuck in the middle of it and stuff like that I, I, don't, I don't even know how to, quite how to describe it but I recognize that uh, this this Thing is happening, um, and you know that's that's kind of an amazing thing right there. And that's something too that I've always like, where you see or hear something that doesn't that you can't label, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we tried to do with uh, with Mondo. Yeah. And yeah, that's something too that's kind of interesting as the more. Uh, marketing has like saturated the internet and so like like what i was talking about like the kind of like youtube narrative culture and things it's all about like branding and you have to stick into your little niche and it's all about pushing your your brand and and sticking to that so you can get more likes and then you can get you know a bigger piece of the advertisement pie and all this kind of stuff that for things too that i'm interested in and i know what what you were doing with with uh, Mondo 2000 and even now with your, your website, like it's it's a broad brush. There's a whole mixture of things that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just, there's new websites out there. I mean, there's tons of psychedelic websites. There's yeah. tons of, of technology uh, websites, whether it's like Wired or, or whatever, but they stick, they seem to stick in their lane, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, that was really, uh... The thing that Hamlin Ward came along is they were genre specific. Um, as much as uh, uh, they were doing sort of journalistic, they had a journalistic approach, where, whereas ours was more eccentric, probably their biggest advantage was that they were genre specific. Um, and, you know, they, they knew where the uh, tech geeks were at and what they were interested in. And uh, we were all over the place. I mean, you could barely really call Mondo 2000 a, a tech magazine. We had rock interviews. I mean, we had we had music. We had pranks, surrealism, borderline porn. I mean, we had everything in there. It was like Jap Japanese uh, used to uh, used to have these magazines that like was every genre of magazine all thrown into one magazine, and. Uh, I remember Eric Gullickson uh, came back from Japan and showed us a Japanese magazine and said, this is like what Mondo is doing. It's like, we, we tried to suck every magazine that we liked into uh, the Mondo 2000 uh, aesthetic. So, you know, we liked rock and roll magazines. We liked, uh, we liked fashion magazines and clubby magazines and humor magazines, Mad Magazine, National Lampoon. We liked Dadaist magazines. We liked all those things. Wet. Uh, we had a hundred different influences. And we basically tried to uh, suck all of it into uh, one, you know, be between the pages of a uh, 164 page magazine. Yeah, and I don't know if I'm quoting Willem S. Burroughs right, but it's something about. If you cut up the past, the future leaks out. Yeah, I think that's exactly what he said, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that always comes to mind. And I think, you know, when you're talking about um, that new music that you were listening to, 
it's you know we're we're all standing on the shoulders of giants right of all this mm-hmm. influence that comes before us and that if the more we play with that the more of this future leaks out the more of yeah uh you know if we're and i i, I do that a lot with whatever it is that i do um these mashup things that i i take clips from like terence mckenna or from your show or whatever and then i put it to some new music that i like whatever i like at that time i think some of the, the funnest stuff that i've done especially in the early times of mines where i was just playing off of whatever my friends were doing like for instance one time my friend uh, took a video of him tagging um uh, by his house at like some like alley and he's like showed it to me and he put it to some smashy pumpkin song and I was like, oh, this is cool. And I was listening to this song that was playing by another friend. And so, you know, I had like a couple of tabs up and I'm like, oh, this is kind of weird that this song uh, time step matches perfectly with the video that my friend sent me. And so I like, I was like, okay, let's put it together and like edit it a little bit. And then I'm like, you know what? Like, let me just do a stream of consciousness about like how I feel about what's going on with my friends and everything and I put it together. And that was kind of funny because uh, later I got told by, cause I know um, the guy that kind of like runs Mines, And he told me that that was the first video that went quote unquote viral on our, our website. <laughs> and it was just like this spare of a moment kind of thing. I guess, you know, as I always think about what's going on and where I want to be and where I have the most fun is I guess doing just that, cutting up the past and letting the future leak out. And um, I guess one last thing I wanted to share with you, it just came to me the other night. Actually, like it was part of this dream and something I've been thinking about. And it kind of goes into this whole thing about future technology. And so I have I have always had these vivid dreams and I, I write them down. But uh, every time I, I write them, they never accurately like kind of grasp what, what really goes on in that dream. And I, I share them, you know, in, in obscure poetry that I write. And some people get it, but not, not, not that many people get it. And I was, there's some uh, brain scanning technology and specifically they were trying to map out like dreams. And so, you know, they'll hook somebody up to the machine and show them pictures and see where the, you know, get a, a brain image map of oh, yeah. how, and then so, yeah. And so they record a dream and then they'll come up with a mock like scenery. You know, they're thinking about a horse and this and that. It's really uh, crude right now. So, and I'm thinking about, it kind of happened to me in, in my dream last night. But what scared me is this technology and, and that will be kind of available in the near future, right? But I'm, I, me being poor, I can't buy the, the, the best technology of it. So I'm getting some kind of free uh, dream scanning uh, software, but it has ads in it. And so like, it kind of like had this slash dream slash vision of me recording my dreams, but there's like ads that are placed in it, but I I can't distinguish if it's an ad or it's my actual dream. And there's this weird feedback loop of these ads invading my dream. And I, I, I can't distinguish between what is my dream and what is reality <laughs> and what actually happened. And I think yeah. that's kind of already what's happening to us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, uh, sounds like an episode of Black Mirror. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a really good show. But, uh, yeah. So, and actually, I was actually reading an article and it was about on, on Mondo uh, that I kind of, which ties into all this is the online ad fungus that spreads in your brain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it's true because a lot of people that are not, uh, even even for me, that tries to stay up on on certain things, trying to uh, just having media literacy, and yeah, more specifically, online media literacy. You know, I noticed when I talk to my my parents, my dad's always getting pissed off because uh, he clicked on something and now they want to know this or that about him, and he right. gets all pissed. And I'm like. Dad, you're clicking on an ad, not an actual article. <laughs> and then yeah. he gets pissed off at me. <laughs> then it's like this whole thing. I'm like, oh God. But that's kind of, you know, it's really interesting. But I think this is where I like ad busters and also what you guys did on Mondo is flipping those ads on its head. And hopefully with the, I, I don't know, maybe 
was there like a hidden attempt to kind of like break that magic spell of uh, these ads? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, there was there was some uh, turn them off going on there with the, the in terms of advertising. I mean, we had some awful advertisers. <laughs> you know, we had some hucksters on there uh, giving us money to sell brain machines that weren't very good. You know, uh, but uh, we did play with it quite a bit. When I go and uh, read the 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 magazines. I, I always uh, kind of laugh and see how you guys uh, rearrange the, the typical ad uh, kind of stick and stick a, your own little um, style or flavor in there. <laughs> yeah, I, well, Al, uh, Queen Moo used to uh, reject ads if they, uh, even from uh, big companies, if, if they didn't fit the style, send them back and say, no, this, this doesn't work. Uh, you need to do something else. Although, I and mean, we did have a very conventional-looking uh, ad for some uh, Microsoft-related software on our back page for for a long time, which in itself made it unusual. It had all the markings of being a, uh, an advertisement for in a generic tech magazine. I mean, at the time, tech magazines were like car magazines there, there was no culture involved it was really just literally about the, the tech until you know we came along and boing boing came along and then wired came along yeah and um kind of have that style i was just thinking too when you were saying that about having kind of like the standard microsoft ad and how it kind of even i guess in a sense mind fuck your own style <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that uh, we were legitimized by uh, aspects of the uh, of the computer industry that uh, some of them advertised in this crazy ass magazine that was really doing some some pretty deeply subversive stuff. And you know, it, uh, of course, record companies were uh, a source of advertising for us as well. Um, but yeah, I was I always loved that. Uh, and we had some really mainstream advertisers uh, coming along, and uh, I think Queen Moo gave them such a hard time that they never ended up uh, doing anything with us. But I, we, our magazine might have ended up uh, smelling like perfume if uh, we had taken uh, uh, s certain ads on on board. You know, I mean, we were like. You know, Anar Anar Anarchist Monkey meets Vanity Fair at some point. <laughs> Scratch and sniff. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was, that's pretty funny. So, I guess um, to wrap things up, is there anything else you want to, like, currently, anything you're working on? or? Um, no, not, not really at, at the moment. Uh, just, uh, you know, my band camp. Uh, people should look at my band camp and there's uh, lots of uh, music on there and lots of new stuff that uh, has been done over the uh, last few years. I believe it's slash Are You Serious on, on band camp. Um, and, uh, you know, it's always a good day for punching a Nazi. And you can find the uh, music punching a Nazi on uh, band camp and also on the, the video on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, definitely check out Are You Serious's music. Um, I'll have links up for that on, on the description. And later, too, I'm, I'm going to write up a, a blog about this to kind of... Actually, I guess that's the last thing I kind of want to end things on. Um, I wanted to do this interview with you because I'm starting um, a group on Minds and kind of wanted to do this kind of, like, launch <laughs> of the group and kind of, like, in a more... Um, direct way i've been subtly my feed's been mixed with a lot of mondo stuff but kind of like push that out there because i think you know uh especially a lot of the people that that i interact on minds would really uh, yeah we've really been enjoying the videos and my partner uh, eve enjoys uh, the inclusion of some of her uh, uh stuff from her revolting video oh. Yeah, that is definitely uh, something that I, I really enjoy and I, I draw a lot of 
inspiration to get the whole are you serious feel to any um video <laughs> like the last one when you're like oh i think it needs a little bit more stuff and i'm like oh the same god damn it i need some more freak out in this and i'm like okay more freak out more freak out <laughs> yeah yeah but so thank you for your time are you no, no. and it was it's, fun it's and, you and uh till next time yeah for sure thanks okay. have a great day take care